Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. So this session is in English. Um, I'm Francesca. And in this session, we're going to go really deep into one specific case of the question of data ownership in the sector of health, health data. And so um, I'm really excited about the panelists we have here because we have a lot of different um, perspectives represented. We're going to have some uh, opinions and understanding more of the EU perspective on this question, as well as the US. And we also have an interesting balance of the question of collective data and the individual perspective on data. So joining me here, um, we have Javi Creos, who is the uh, founder of Ideas for Change. He's from Barcelona. And uh, hi his company does a lot of consulting on strategies for open, collaborative, um, exponential growth. And Andrew Hoppen, he is from the US. And he's an entrepreneur and an investor. He's going to tell you more about what he does. And one fun fact is that Andrew and I are actually both part of a fellowship program in New Zealand about global impact. So we just were there a, a few days ago. So um, I'm going to let you now get some more uh, in-depth insight into what both of these are working on in the area of health data. And then we're going to have some time for discussion about some of the interesting aspects. So I'm going to pass it over to Javi to tell us a little more about what you're up to. Your microphone is there. Micro, and how do I pass the slides? Can someone help us with a clicker? Ah, here we go. Is there a clicker by any chance? Okay. So what we'll just ah, here we go. Okay. So what I'd like to, to introduce you is Salus Coop, and it's uh, this is a citizen cooperative of data for health research. And the starting point of this parliament and assembly is this phrase of Angela Merkel, who told us, who owns the data will decide in the end whether democracy, a participatory social model, and economic uh, prosperity can be compatible. And that's the moment that we are. Data has not become the new oil, but the new soil, and we have to drill it. So we ask ourselves, why not? What, and, and now we go down to health data. What happens with data? First, our data cures. No, if you sum up bases, if you look at more data than you looked, you can cure pe uh, people better. In Europe, at least, and we'll discuss about that, our data belongs to us. We have four rights on our data. Data for health research is not easily accessible because our institutions protect, protect, and they do OK, uh, access to health data. And on the, uh, on the other side, there's this revolution in genetics where genetics and data are absolutely the same. So what we thought is, what if, if we citizens could take the data we have from data keepers, public health centers, private health entities, uh, wearables, mobile, and so on, we could devise our, ourselves under which terms we want to donate, we want uh, research centers or assistance centers to access this data, and we convert ourselves in the governance, that's why we are a cooperative, of this data that is relevant for health research. So first thing we did, we interviewed 36 people from uh, medicals, nurses, patients, uh, patients associations, everyone involved, uh, involved in the breast cancer ecosystem in Barcelona. And we told them about the idea, and we what, how would, uh, should we donate their data or not. We conducted workshops with them. And what we found out is that generating that abundance for some purposes is really a systemic change in health research. If we provided uh, some sort of researchers with that abundance, more data than they have, more diverse data than they have, more continuous data than they have, our uh, medicine would improve much faster. And so what put up next is a machine, like the moral machine of the MIT, which tells you if the autonomous car cannot break, should it take the two ladies or the three youngsters? We put up a, a system to know the opinion of people under which conditions would they donate their data, depending on who requests the data, which data is requested, what is research conducted for, and how will research be shared. And we put uh, this app, which is still on. You can see it at uh, ideasforchange.com slash 3M. And we got 8,000 results. And we organized the results, these scenarios that combine these four variables upon the uh, propensivity 
to be in a, to for people to donate their data. So there are uh, scenarios on which 87% of the people would donate their data, and there are uh, other scenarios where only 20%, 21% uh, would donate their data. And we came out with uh, a deeper understanding of how we uh, think about data donation for health research. First issue is shared results. You know? And what we citizens think as a whole is that I'm ready to donate my data in exchange for collective knowledge. And that's the first issue. Second is nonprofit entities. I don't want commercial entities to take advantage of my data and only critical diseases, not aesthetical diseases or things that may we may not have uh, diagnosed or labeled as a disease yet. No? no risk are allowed. We are very afraid of re-identification and so on. And uh, surprisingly, uh, no incentives change a decision. That's to say, if you decided not to donate your data, because you're against, let's say, research on aesthetical things, even if I offer you money or a uh, personalized analysis, you wouldn't change your opinion. Out of that, we created the Salus Common Good License, which we are starting to operate right now. What we took is the best case scenario, and it's based on five warranties. First warranty is your data will only be used for research on chronic and rare diseases, which are very well documented. Second warranty, your data will only be used for non-commercial entities. Third warranty is any result obtained from research with your data will be open, will be published openly and at no cost for everyone. Fourth is will protect your privacy, anonymizing data as much as we can. 100% is very difficult, uh, uh, even if it puts in the image. You cannot warranty, but if you got great uh, number of people, that's more possible. Fifth warranty, you can change your, uh, your opinion, your settings at any time. So what we're doing now, we're still building the, co the cooperative already exists. We have the license. We want to create an app, and uh, we'll talk with Cover US, we'll see, to help citizens gather their own data, how much they walk, how much they eat, so on, so on, so on. And we'll have uh, <coughs> uh, contracts with data operators which want to use our license, first, to legitimize the data they already have, second, to have access to more data. And that's the point at which we are. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Javi. So then we'll pass it over to Andrew to tell us about his project, Cover Us. We will get the slides up here, and I'll get my mic up here. It's on? Are we good? OK, excellent. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm really thrilled to be here, and in particular, thrilled to be here with uh, Javi, because we're arriving at a very similar place uh, with what I'm working on at Cover Us, but from a very different starting point, from a very different perspective. What we're focused on is an issue that's very specific to the US, I think, um, in particular, which is that you shouldn't have to be wealthy in order to be healthy. And unfortunately, in the wealthiest country in the world, the reality is, sadly, that you do have to be wealthy in order to be healthy uh, on average in the United States. 37% of Americans can't afford an unexpected $100 medical bill. So you start making choices between taking out more credit card debt or cutting back on food purchases or going to the doctor. And something that's not in this slide, which is very scary to me, is that when you get a, a refund of your taxes from the government, which happens for most Americans every year, once a year, the number one thing people spend that on is our medical procedures that they've delayed doing. So people are not going to get medical care when they should, simply because of money. And so this is uh, obviously unethical in my view, but it also is just frankly strange because at the same time, we spend more money on healthcare than any other country in the world. We spend $3 trillion, okay? And we have companies, one in particular that makes about $20 billion a year from buying and selling our data and doing things with it in the health system. And so this uh, is very strange, even now, I'm glad to say, to regulators and politicians. And we're starting to wake up that the situation is just bad for everybody. And we have Europe to thank for this, I think, in part, because the pressure and the, the perceived risk of GDPR on business models of some of the health companies and health data companies in the US has really started to create a shift that we've already seen in terms of their openness to changing their business model and how they interact with us about our data. 
So what we're doing very simply is we're trying to give people a new technological opportunity through a mobile platform to do very much what Javi said. Aggregate your data, uh, put it into a context where you get to say what is done and is not done with your data, and then create value from that data. That value can be social value, it can be health value, and in our case, we think it could also be economic value. So once you've aggregated a lot of data about yourself and said, yes, I'm okay being targeted with an offer to do something based on this data, but not on that data, or maybe this year, but not next year, then we find ways to help you save money, and we find ways to help you get paid money to do things like fill out surveys, go to the doctor when you should, and uh, perhaps do other things like get a rebate on something you are gonna pay for out of pocket, but that's gonna make you healthier and save the health system money. So once we've done that, uh, you look at, it looks sort of like this. You have a, um, a mobile app, and in that mobile app, you're given invitations that are based on what your data says about you that you can accept or reject, and you can make money or save money from fulfilling those invitations, things like filling out surveys. And so what we're trying to do is part of a movement of a whole lot of companies and nonprofit organizations that are really pushing in the same direction is saying that if we in the U.S. can fill financial gaps, that'll help people to be healthier and that'll save the health system money and be good for all of us. And on top of that, the way to get there is by putting us in more control of our data, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because that actually makes the data better. Because only I can aggregate all the, the data that is about me. Even the best medical record system in the world can't, can't do that. And then finally, if we do all that, then we should be able to have a more two-way street relationship between me as a patient and my doctor and companies that are developing new drugs in the whole health system. And right now, that relationship is very fragmented and broken, in part because people are scared to share the reality that there's so much data about me that is being stored in different places by different organizations and companies. So we think all this needs to change, um, but it can only change if, at the end of the day, we respect people. For us, this comes down to not just what's legal to do with data, and right now in the US, it's pretty much legal to do almost anything. That's a little bit of an oversimplification, but a lot more free uh, to do things with my data uh, than it is here in Europe. Uh, also looking, obviously, at what's ethical and getting really smart, deep thinkers about the ethics of this to be involved because even I, working on this as a company, don't feel sophisticated enough to make all the decisions about what is and is not a good idea about my data. It's a very specialized domain. And then finally, there are some things that I think are personal preference. I may not care if I get advertisements inviting me to do things that save me money that relate to a health condition I may have, but somebody else may very much mind um, because it's psychologically distressing to them. And that may be, be a legitimate personal pre uh, point of preference. So context matters is basically the main bottom line. And then the most important thing, I think, in the pr uh, proposition that you're all considering here today is should data about you be owned? And it may seem a simple binary question at first, yes or no. Um, but really, we, I think it's much more nuanced than that. It's data about you, but it's collected by lots of other entities and lots of other organizations. Your doctor, your insurance company, social media companies, they're all collecting data about you. So should you own that data, like you could sell it, like I could then give it to Javi and suddenly now he owns it because it was my property? Or should it be simply that I have some uh, ability to say what can and can't be done with that data, but I don't own it? And therefore I also maybe don't have the liability of knowing, needing to take care of it in a particular way. Or is there some middle ground where I have a copyright on it, I have the rights to say some things, perhaps I have the rights to get compensated for the value that it creates in some contexts, but it's not ownership as property. So these questions right now are literally being debated in about six different US state legislatures right now. And there are bills being lobbied on by paid political lobbyists on both sides. And our company's being asked to take a position. And our position really is that it depends. It's very contextual. This is a really complicated domain. So unfortunately, I'd be sitting there in the middle, not on either of these two sides. Thanks. Thank you. Give him a round of applause. Yeah, so I think that gives us a good first overview and really uh, starting to show how complex this question that we're actually trying to vote on really is and how granular we need to be out the about the different factors. Um, so I guess one thing I wanted to do now was sort of take a brief step back and sort of try to summarize a little bit for all of us to, to wrap our heads around all these different elements. Um, if you had to sort of summarize in a few key points, um, what are some of the main ways that we can actually use health data when we're collecting it? What are the advantages? First thing we would say we should differentiate among health data and data for health research. 
No, health data is about genomics. Genomics explains 10% of our health. Clinical data, clinical radiographies and illnesses, that explains 20% of our health. Uh, <clears throat> Socioeconomical, no, where you live, how much you earn, what education you got, that explains 30%. 40% of your health is explained by how much exercise you do, what do you eat, do you get enough sleep, do you have uh, happy social relationships. So first thing is that we should be able to take that into the health research. You know? And second observation, and we've been talking, is health data and data for health research is very valuable at a collective level for research and, and at individual level to change behavior. No, that's the, the point we got. Yeah, do you want to say more about the that? Yeah, so I, I, I would just add that uh, the data about you is useful in terms of uh, potentially incentivizing you to change your behavior. Uh, one third of prescriptions in the United States don't get filled every year, meaning that a doctor has said you need this drug, and one third of the time people are not actually getting that drug. And uh, that, if you actually need it, is bad for everybody. You get sicker, it becomes more expensive to take care of you later, et cetera. Um, so data that can point out when that's happening and figure out how to get you to actually do the thing that you should do to be healthy can be really useful. Um, but the other thing is very simply, even doctors in the US don't have really good comprehensive access to all the data about you to take the best care of you that they can. They have 15 minutes to see you. They don't know what happened at home last night that made you feel the way that you're feeling today. They don't really have time to ask you about that when, when, they c when you come in, go in to see them. So having more comprehensive data about us can also help doctors to take care of us better. Okay, yeah. And so you were touching briefly, Andrew, upon this question of ethics, which is probably one of the most interesting questions here. So um, I'd like to sort of go a little deeper into what all the different ethical considerations are or guidelines that we should be thinking about um, in this question of sharing health data. What do you think, what are some good starting points for that question? Our option, you've seen, it's crowdsourcing ethics. No, we believe we are citizens, we are educated, we are informed, we know what we talk about. This is a very relevant collective choice, as Angela Merkel was pointing. So we, we believe that the best way is to crowdsource ethics at this point in time. Yeah, so as I said, it, it's, it's contextual, meaning the ethics of one situation, like I want, if I am in a uh, unconscious and I want somebody trying to take care of me to know everything about me so that they can take better care of me, that's pretty clear. Um, in another context, I agree with the 100% uh, you know, uh, 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 parts of your license. That context for me is clearly ethical. But I think there's a lot of gray area as well where you may be happy to sell your data and get money for it if it's not actually exposing you to individual risk and if it's actually going to help develop a better drug, even by a company. And you may or may not believe in the ethics of the company, but you may actually end up contributing to commercial research which results in a drug that actually can help save lives, perhaps even mine. So those kind of things are, I think are legitimate individual choice. And the big take home for me is that it just shouldn't be up to only commercial companies. It shouldn't even, in my view, be up only to governments. You really need to involve individuals and communities of individuals in that decision. And one final thing I'll say about that is that even if you say, and it sort of might be a, a stereotypical American libertarian kind of viewpoint, that I should get to say everything about my data, no matter what, do whatever I want with it, including sell it, you also have to consider that in the case of data about us, because we're kind of like each other, especially people in our family, or perhaps people in our neighborhood, data that I do something with about me actually reflects on those people as well. So I could potentially be exposing my communities or my cohorts to risk. For example, if I sell my genomic data and my brother has a condition which has, therefore they lose their health insurance in the US because somebody found out that I have a genome which makes me at risk of getting very sick. Yeah, I think that's a really key point. And um, before talking to Andrew, I wasn't really aware of that aspect, that actually it can't just be to us as individuals to decide on the ownership, but it's actually about the whole group. Um, so I guess going further along that line of thinking, um, who do you think in the future will actually be capable or in the right position to make these kind of decisions? Because it sounds like you have to have a lot of expertise and quite deep understanding of the different contexts. So it seems there's a big question around, is it individuals, citizens, legislators? Who's going to be doing this? We conducted some workshops in the first phase and uh, when GPDR was coming to Europe. And we said, okay, you own your data already. You can manage it. And there are four possibilities. Either you do whatever with your data, 
no? Uh, and you have lots of freedom, but very little agency. You cannot change the agenda of research or care or anything. You can change it for peanuts to a commercial company, no? Such as we do with Facebook or Google, no? You give your data and you get services. You can share it with your public institutions so you rely on them. There are only two countries that rely on their institutions, Estonia and Finlandia. Either we group as citizens to govern our data because each individual, the relationship of each individual with the data users is very asymmetrical. No, you're very small and they're very big. So we have to find individuals are the most relevant unit, but it's not the only unit to consider in this framework, I would say. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. I think that um, there's, it's only ethical if the individual is given power and choice in this. And in fact, you need the individual to be involved and aware because you need their data and their engagement to really make this, this uh, better data future happen. At the same time, it's, I don't want to wake up in the morning worrying about this or trying to figure it out. It's way too complicated. So I want to rely on a collective, a community of people, hopefully including experts that in fact are professionals at figuring out the actually ethics of this. And so to me that leads to uh, versions of a data union, versions of a data trust, and I think there should be individual agency about perhaps which data union or which data trust to affiliate with, rather than that being something that's legislated or mandated. I think that's the best way to balance these complexities. The final thing I'd say, which is kind of good news, is that the technologies maybe aren't totally mature yet, but we see signs of being able to handle this complexity technologically in a way that I think would have been difficult even five years ago with the decentralizing technology and smart contracts and all these, all these buzzwords that actually potentially allow us to accommodate a lot of complexity, but make sure that it's really being accommodated well and to be able to audit that so that ultimately we can trust this very large, very complex, many stakeholder system that we're talking about making even more complex so that it can work better. So um, before I ask my last question, I wanted to say that we'll have time for one question from the audience, so if you want to think about that. Um, so what do you see then the, the, the role of government and legislators in this? Because um, you're talking about these new types of unions that should be created, so, so what, what does the legislator do? So I think in the US it's really uh, making sure that we have an independent, non-governmental, non-corporate uh, set of institutions that are empowered to figure this out and to make calls about it. I'm, I'm not a fan of laws that are being proposed in the US that say individuals own their data and, and do whatever they want with it, no matter what. I'm also not a fan of the status quo in the US where basically I don't have much power over most of my data. Um, so I think it's about creating a new set of rules and a new set of actors that are explicitly recognizing that this is really complicated and it's something that we're going to figure out based on a whole lot of different contexts and the evolution of technologies that will enable us to do a better and better job balancing this tension between privacy and sharing. So um, that's unfortunately the uh, simplest answer I can give is that legislators should recognize that it's really complex and context dependent and create new institutions and new bodies that are designed to actually be able to address that. We look at public institutions as collaborators. We're talking with them with this, this, this license and they want to adopt it for two things. First is to legitimize the data they already have. Public institutions have our data but don't have our consent to have it and to use it. Second, uh, public health uh, research is done on public uh, services of, of health and uh, questionnaires to people. So, and, and that doesn't show reality. We can offer them a way to use the data they already have, data from the private sector providing services, and data from our lifestyle, from our, our mobiles. So public health are very interested in legitimating their data and diversifying the data they use for research. Great, that's really interesting insights. Is there any question? We have one question. Okay, over here. You get the one question. Yeah, I feel, I feel a bit bad for but there being only one question. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was very interesting. Now, my question is in terms of the law that we <coughs> need to make a decision on, is would you, the two of you, would you change the sentence that is being proposed right now? Great, because that was my, quest my last question. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. I think it's pretty narrow, and if you look at how much would fa Facebook pay you for your one-year data, 
that would be five euros. So I think that when we think in terms of selling our data, we're fooling ourselves in a way, uh, and that doesn't change that. If you change behaviors, that's very powerful, but the value of data is aggregated data. And that's uh, my stand on this. I'll say two things and then answer your question. One, um, the value in at least the US context of your data can actually be quite large. If you think of it not about the data itself as the, the asset of value, but about what the data can help you to do. So it's your engagement that's informed by your data that can create a lot of value. And in the US context, it's a lot of value because we have so much waste, a trillion dollars wasted every year. And if I just went to the doctor because I had enough money to do it, that would save a lot of money. So is that the value of data and is it selling my data? Not really, but it certainly is fundamental that I have the ability to get my data and to say what is done with it in order to unlock that value or that potential savings. Um, so to answer your question, in a risk context, uh, I think in Europe, the, my understanding is that you already have a precedent for your data basically being owned and controlled by you much more than we do in the US. And so in a, in a, in a European context, to me, the proposition is too simplistic and not understanding the nuance in the context, uh, which would be the next step in Europe. On the other hand, in the US, I would actually be supportive of this proposition because I think we need to create forcing factors for change because our status quo is so bad. And this would at least bring all the other actors that like the status quo to the table to have a proposition like this adopted in the US. Great. So does that mean that your recommendation to everyone here when they're going to vote is? I would say no, given that we are sitting in Europe right now. I would say yes, but not only. OK, great. So how is everyone here feeling about what they're going to vote on? Do you think you want to change where you're sitting? Or show of hands, um, who's maybe changed their opinion? Everyone changed their opinion after the session? Not much? OK, great. Well, you'll have some time. Sure, sure, OK, go for it. I want to make yes. an experiment. No, I'm, uh, you know, the Salus Common Good license. And I'm going to ask you whether you would share your data. I'll repeat the five statements. And you, you raise your hands if you agree. First, your data will only be used for medical research. Your data will only be used by non-commercial non institutions. Your data <coughs> will be conveniently anonymized, so reidentification won't be possible. Any result obtained from research using your data will be published openly at no cost for everyone, and you can change your settings at any moment. Who's in? Who would share their health data? Who would share how much they walk? OK, thank you so much. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you to the panelists. Uh, super interesting. If you want to continue the conversation, just uh, come and chat to them. And I'll hand it back to Clementine.